In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. The temple that we call Solomon's Temple took seven years to build. It was completed in 958 BC. That's the point where Jerusalem became his home. That is, God's special presence, known as the glory of the Lord, took up residence and filled the holy place, the holy of holies, when that temple was dedicated by Solomon in 1958, or 958 BC. That special presence of the Lord departed the holy place in 586 BC. The book of Ezekiel tells us that that's what happened. For 372 years, God's special presence, known in Hebrew as the Kavod Adonai, translated for us as the glory of the Lord, sometimes referred to by the Jews themselves as the Shekinah. 372 years, God's special presence dwelt with God's people and called Jerusalem home, right there in the holy place. But their perversion... Their idolatry, their rebellion, drove God to unleash his fury when that temple was destroyed in 586 and that special presence departed. Jerusalem was no longer home to the glory of the Lord. But God was determined to deliver his people. And so part of that was a 70-year exile where they had a little bit of a time out. And eventually the Lord allowed a remnant to, to come back and start rebuilding the temple to a degree. And so now, 619 years after this special presence, this glory of the Lord has departed, God now sends a new special presence, the God man back into this city of Jerusalem on this special day that we call Palm Sunday. The gospel message is God's response to weak love and a talking snake. We don't know where this talking snake came from. He does not have a backstory when he shows up in this story about the first couple, but there he is in Adam's house, the garden, and he sets into motion a series of events that wreaks havoc amongst mankind. It causes he and his wife both to be homeless, and sin and death now become the new normal, and hell becomes their new home. But God's determined to deliver, absolutely determined to deliver. This one event led to century upon century upon century of God activity that brings us basically to this day and to everything in this week that follows. Recall with me how his birth was foretold from ancient times and how God delivered as promised into the loneliness of a barn or a cave, wherever animals were held, with not a whole lot of fanfare, worshipped only by shepherds, and not well understood by them. His life, his ministry, was a constant going forward, never retreating, um, just always promoting and and getting out there the mission of his father's gospel and the will that his father wanted him to do and let people know. As he went through his life, he ate up and digested every possible righteous requirement of his father's will. He was without fail, perfect in every way. Today, he returns home. He returns home to the Love and adoration and cries of joy of the crowd there in Jerusalem. And they're shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet, 
just as John wrote in his gospel. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Five days from now, he will be trudging the long and lonely road up to the altar of the cross. But still, he is determined to deliver because that's his father's will for him. At a certain point, Jesus knew that it was time to go up to Jerusalem. It's not that he hadn't been there before. I mean, he was a duty-bound good Jew, which had three mandatory uh, festivals that he had to attend. Uh, there was the previous cleansing. So he's definitely been to Jerusalem before, but he knew that this was the trip. And it's not like he hadn't told his disciples up front about this. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And so when he left Bethany on that Thursday, he knew that he would be going to stay. He would not be leaving. But the truth of that trip is that nothing, absolutely nothing in this world would ever be the same from that point on. Today, you and I ponder the Son of God who could have come swooping into Jerusalem on a comet, let him off and climb up on a white stallion steed and get himself some nice shining sword and shining armor, and he could have just ridden into Jerusalem and just taken it by force. Instead, he rides in on a baby donkey, a smelly beast of burden. Why? Why a donkey, of all things? Well, so that every Jewish memory would recall the words that had been spoken by the prophet Zechariah 500 years earlier that you just heard Pastor Thompson read to you. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Hopefully, with one last effort, he might be able to get the message across. Prophecy was pronounced. Prophecy is fulfilled. Promise was made. Promise is kept. Maybe someone in the crowd might actually get the message. But the point is that even if they didn't, Jesus is determined to deliver on his, his mission. Why? Because this is how sin, death, and hell are going to be defeated. You and I have been to this Palm Sunday parade a few times before, and you know what you're going to see. Tomorrow, Monday, He's going to get off that donkey and he's going to go check out his and his father's and the Holy Spirit's temple. That's today, sorry. Tomorrow, he's going to go back to the temple and he's going to cleanse it now for the second time. On Tuesday, he is going to be confronted and challenged by every major Jewish group. And sadly, they are all going to be asked one very important question. What do you think of the Christ? And tragically, they are all going to give the wrong answer. On Wednesday, it is Silent Wednesday. We have no idea what Jesus was doing. Probably, according to his tradition, he was probably spending it in prayer in preparation for the days that are coming. On Thursday, we find Jesus washing the dirty feet of his disciples. And we see him sweating blood and praying that this cup might be taken from him. 
and we see him betrayed by a friend and another friend denies him and the other friends they just run away well now we get to Friday and in the wee hours of Friday there is a sham trial there are trumped up charges and then there is a slap in the face then off to governor Herod and Herod has his way and he's intrigued and he wants him to do a miracle for him but Herod grows bored and he sends him back to Pilate where he will receive a monstrous beating and a death sentence and a long lonely walk to a hill outside of the city it's really too much to retell here this morning, but there's the highlights. You, you know what's going to happen. Come back this week and you'll hear it all again. And just like every year, it's really too much to watch. But we have to. Because Jesus was determined to deliver for your soul. Because this is the only way that sin, death, and hell could be defeated. Well, let's go back to the crowd for a second. The crowd's all excited that Jesus is going to come. They didn't think that he would. His disciples did not want him to come. They feared that he would be arrested. I mean, there is a death sentence out on him. They know this. They know that the Sanhedrin wants him dead. But the crowd, they hailed him as the son of David, and they, they shouted, Hosanna! which means, Lord, save us. And what is it that you suppose they wanted saving from? The Romans? I mean, they had no doubt. I, I'm not arguing the fact that they honestly believed that he really was the promised Messiah and that they honestly believed that he really did come from God. But what is it that they wanted saving from? Probably the Romans. That seems to be their real wish here. Otherwise, how else do you explain the change of the crowd and their tone and tenor before Pilate on Good Friday? Well, this riding in noble king, um, he still hears our hosannas when we cry them out, even to today. But I have to ask you, what is it that you want saving from when you cry that word? See, nowhere has he promised that he's going to rebuild your RRSP that has taken a hit since 2008. Nowhere has he promised that he's going to conjure up a, 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 a great medical cure for your illness. Nowhere has he promised that he's going to spare you from, or one of your loved ones, from that drunk driver that crosses the center line. Nowhere has he promised these things. But, but what he has promised, this is what he will do. He will look into your heart and he will see sin there. He will see the sins that leak out and the sins that you try to keep contained. He will see the sins that keep you awake at night that hang like lead weights burdening your conscience. He will see the sins, the just yesterday sins, he will see the sins of long ago, the ones that when you recall them, they cause you to cringe and they actually cause you to wonder, this is so bad that could this actually send me to hell? And the answer is without Jesus and faith in Jesus as your savior, yes. Yes, it can and it will. Jesus is going to, and he will, look into your hearts and he will see this putrid mess this coming week that we commemorate. And he will take that putrid mess upon himself and he will carry it all the way to that cursed cross and he will pay the punishment that those putrid sins deserve. And then he will present his perfect, noble, upright, just character to his God and Father. And he will say, deal, 
my life for theirs. And his God and Father will answer him, deal. Your life for theirs. And it will all be finished. Because that's how sin, death, and hell are defeated. At a certain point, Jesus knew that it was a time for him to go to Jerusalem and go through what he's going to go through this coming week. Today, our time has come. Our time has come to walk with the Son of God, our Savior, down into the valley of the shadow of death and out the other end to an empty tomb. This God that could have swooped in on a comet but chose to ride in on a smelly beast of burden as a servant and a humble one at that. You see, in this holy week, we receive the meal of the new covenant, which is the forgiveness of sins. In this holy week, we see the love that not only washed feet, but it washes away sins. In this holy week, we hear the cry that assures us that the work to save us is finished. And in this holy week, we see an empty tomb with, almost as a sense of humor, neatly folded grave clothes sitting there on the, on the grave. And an, angel, and an angel's voice saying, he is not here. He is risen. Brothers and sisters, behold your king. Behold your king who has come home to die, who has come home to rise, who has come home to rule. Behold your king who always was and who always is, deliver, determined to deliver. Determined to deliver you from Holy Week to Easter, from earth to heaven, and to make his home in your heart. Worship him this week. Praise him this week. Adore him this week. Preach of him to your friends and family this week. Invite your friends and family to come and see him so that perhaps he will make his home in their heart. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Your Savior Jesus. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. It will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.